This is day four of Rohatsu, and we are reading from Thich Nhat Hanh's Old Path White Clouds on Chapter 18, The Morning Star Has Risen. Through mindfulness, Siddhartha's body, mind and breath were perfectly at one. His practice of mindfulness had enabled him to build great powers of concentration, which he could now use to shine awareness on his mind and body. After deeply entering meditation, he began to discern the presence of countless other beings in his own body, right in the present moment. Organic and inorganic beings, minerals, mosses, and grasses, insects, animals and people were all within him. He saw that other beings were himself right in the present moment. He saw his own past lives, all his births and deaths. He saw the creation and destruction of thousands of worlds and thousands of stars. He felt all the joys and sorrows of every living being, those born of mothers, those born of eggs, those born of fission, who divided themselves into new creatures. He saw that every cell of his body contained all the heaven, all of heaven and earth, and spanned the three times, past, present and future. It was the hour of the first watch of the night. Gautama entered even more deeply into meditation. He saw how countless worlds arose and fell, were created and destroyed. He saw how countless beings passed through countless births and deaths. He saw that these births and deaths were but outward appearances and not true reality, just as millions of waves rise and fall incessantly on the surface of the sea, while the sea itself is beyond birth and death. If the waves understood that they themselves were water, they would transcend birth and death and arrive at true inner peace, overcoming all fear. This realization enable, enabled Gautama to transcend the net of birth and death, and he smiled. His smile was like a flower blossoming in the deep night, which re radiated a halo of light. It was the smile of a wondrous understanding, the insight into the, into the destruction of all defilements. He attained this level of understanding by the second watch. At just that moment, thunder crashed and great bolts of lightning flashed across the sky as if to rip the heavens in two. Black clouds concealed the moon and stars. Rain poured down. Gautama was soaking wet, but he did not budge. He continued his meditation. Without wavering, he shined his awareness on his mind. He saw that living beings suffer because they do not understand that they share one common ground with all beings. Ignorance gives rise to a multitude of sorrows, confusions and troubles. Greed, anger, arrogance, doubt, jealousy and fear all have their roots in ignorance. When we learn to calm our minds in order to look deeply at the true nature of things, we can arrive at full understanding which dissolves every sorrow and anxiety and gives rise to acceptance and love. Gautama now saw that understanding and love are one. Without understanding, there can be no love. Each person's disposition is the result of physical, emotional and social conditions. When we understand this, we cannot hate even a person who behaves cruelly, but we can strive to help trans form his or her physical, emotional and social conditions. Understanding gives rise to compassion and love, which in turn gives rise to correct action. In order to love, it is first necessary to understand. So understanding is the key to liberation. In order to attain clear understanding, it is necessary to live mindfully making direct contact with life in the present moment. 
truly seeing what is taking place within and outside of oneself. Practicing mindfulness strengthens the ability to look deeply, and when we look deeply into the heart of anything, it reveals itself. This is the secret treasure of mindfulness. It leads to the realization of liberation and enlightenment. Life is illuminated by right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Siddhartha called this the Noble Eightfold Path. Looking deeply into the heart of all beings, Siddhartha attained insight into everyone's minds, no matter where they were, and he was able to hear everyone's cries of both suffering and joy. He attained to the states of divine sight, divine hearing, and the ability to travel across all distances without moving. It was now the end of the third watch, and there was no more thunder. The clouds rolled back to reveal the bright moon and stars. Gautama felt as though a prison which had been confining him for thousands of lifetimes had broken open. Ignorance had been his jail keeper. Because of ignorance, his mind had been obscured, just like the moon and stars hidden by the storm clouds. Clouded by endless waves of deluded thoughts, the mind had falsely divided reality into subject and object, self and other, existence and non-existence, birth and death, and from these discriminations arose wrong views, the prisons of feelings, craving, grasping and becoming, the suffering of birth, old age, sickness and death only made the prison walls thicker. The only thing to do was to seize the jail keeper and see his true face. The jail keeper was ignorance, and the means to overcome ignorance was the noble eightfold path. Once the jail keeper was gone, the jail would disappear and never be rebuilt again. The hermit Gautama smiled and whispered to himself, O oh, jailer, I see you now. How many lifetimes have you confined me in the prisons of birth and death? But now I see your face clearly, and from now on you can build no more prisons around me. Looking up, Siddhartha saw the morning star appear on the horizon, twinkling like a huge diamond. He had seen this star so many times before while sitting beneath the papala tree. But this morning, it was like seeing it for the first time. It was as dazzling as the jubilant smile of enlightenment. Siddhartha gazed at the, at the star and exclaimed out in great compassion, All beings contain within themselves the seeds of enlightenment and yet we drown in the ocean of birth and death for so many thousands of lifetimes. Siddhartha knew he had found the great way, he had attained his goal, and now his heart experienced perfect peace and ease. He thought about his years of searching, filled with disappointments and hardships. He thought of his father, mother, aunt, Yasudhara, Rahula, and all of his friends. He thought of the palace, Kapilavastu, his people and country, and of all those who lived in hardship and poverty, especially children. He promised to find a way to share his discovery to help all others liberate themselves from suffering. Out of his deep insight emerged a profound love for all beings. Along the grassy riverbank, colourful flowers blossomed in the early morning sunlight. Sun danced on leaves and sparkled on the water. His pain was gone. All the wonders of life revealed themselves. Everything appeared strangely new. How wondrous were the blue skies and the drifting white clouds. He felt as though he and all the universe had been newly created. Just then, Savasti appeared. When Siddhartha saw the young buffalo boy come running towards him, he smiled. Suddenly Svasti stopped in his tracks and stared at Siddhartha, his mouth wide open. Siddhartha called, Svasti. The boy came to his senses and answered, Teacher. Savasti joined his palms and bowed. 
he took a few steps forward and then stopped and gazed again at Siddhartha in awe. Embarrassed by his own behaviour, he spoke haltingly. Teacher, you look so different today. Siddhartha motioned for the boy to approach. He took him into his arms and asked, How do I look different today? Gazing up at Siddhartha, Svasti answered, It's hard to say, it's just that you look so different. It's like, like you were a star. Siddhartha patted the boy on the head and said, Is that so? What else do I look like? You look like a lotus that's just blossomed, and like, like the moon over the peaks. Siddhartha looked at Svasti's eyes and said, Why, you are a poet, Svasti. Now tell me, why are you here so early today, and where are your buffaloes? Svasti explained that he had taken the day off, as all the buffaloes were being used to plough the fields. Only the calf had been left in its stall. Today his only responsibility was to cut grass. During the night he and his sisters and brother were awakened by the roar of thunder. Rain pounded through their leaky roof, soaking their beds. They had never experienced a storm, a storm so fierce, and they worried about Siddhartha in the forest. They huddled together until the storm subsided and they could fall back to sleep. When day broke, Savasti ran to the buffalo stall to fetch his sickle and carrying pole and made his way to the forest to see if Siddhartha was all right. Siddhartha grasped Savasti's hand. This is the happiest day I have ever known. If you can bring all the children to come to see me by the papala tree this afternoon, don't forget to bring your brother and sisters. But first, go and cut the kusa grass you need for your buffaloes. Savasti trotted off happily as, as Siddhartha began to take slow steps along the sun-bathed shore. So the first thing I'd like to comment on in this chapter is how throughout the whole chapter, in almost every paragraph, there's references to nature in some way, to plants, to insects and animals, to grass, leaves, trees, sky, clouds, water. It's so easy for us to focus on uh, people and on larger animals when we're reading something. It's often so easy for us to focus on events and actually skip past all of the non-sentient aspects of a story. They're there, but they're kind of secondary. Like right at the end of the story, when the Buddha's just had his enlightenment, but he's concerned about the buffaloes and the kusa grass, which I think is lovely, and I want to say something about that in a little while. But when we think of kusa grass and buffaloes, I think it's very easy to focus on the buffaloes as the primary thing, that the kusa grass is for the buffaloes. But if we can see equally the kusa grass and the buffaloes as just equal, then we have this capacity to be in to be taught 24 hours a day we are always surrounded by objects we are constantly surrounded by non-sentience sometimes we have sentience in our life many times in the day but we're always surrounded by objects so we can let every object be our teacher every single object can be our teacher all the time it's this incredible gift that we have and that the Buddha was awakened by the morning star is this beautiful example of how the non-sentients are there to teach us. We just need to turn our awareness towards them wherever we are, all the time, day and night. 
in bed at night where we pull the blanket up just over our shoulders because we're getting a little cold or we'll just adjust our pillow We'll lean over and turn the lamp on, the night light. We can be being taught all the time. We're surrounded by teachers. At the beginning of the chapter, it says, Organic and inorganic beings, minerals, mosses and grasses, insects, animals and people were all within him. He saw that other beings were himself right in the present moment. And this is a theme that's come up throughout the readings over the last few days. Seeing deeply that we are made of non-self elements. Seeing deeply that we are made of everything other than ourselves. That we can't locate ourselves anywhere. We're just made up of everything else. And that everything else is also made up of everything else. So there's no boundary in the end between us and anything. And sitting deeply with that in Zazen, if we bring our mind to that contemplation, fear will subside in us, anger will subside in us. Any feelings of loneliness and isolation will subside in us. But it does require that we contemplate deeply and really understand it in our bones. I like too the reference to his smile. You know, smiling, there's something so beautiful when we smile just naturally at each other. Um, sometimes I think when people tell a joke, a joke that's not at the expense of anybody, but is more like uh, tapping into our common understanding about the human condition, the sort of natural smile that, we, that arises when we uh, hear some kind of joke made at the expense of the human condition, so reminding us this common way in which we suffer and how we created ourselves. That little smile is, I think, like an awakened smile. And when we see each other and we just naturally smile, we don't force a smile, it just happens. We just see someone, oh, and we smile. It's like an awakened smile. It's a moment of deep understanding when we smile that way. The smile is an expression of our understanding of interdependence and no self so we can appreciate smiles there's the story of the buddha holding up a flower and twirling the flower and mahakasyapa smiles and the buddha recognizes that smile it's a smile of understanding a smile of intimacy Also in this chapter, there's uh, a number of places where the emphasis is placed on understanding, that understanding is the key to liberation. And this understanding isn't about knowledge. It's really very simple. The, things, the thing that we need to understand is so simple, like Zen is so simple, and even Buddhism is so simple in a lot of ways. It's really understanding impermanence, which is another way of saying continual flux, like everything is always in flux. Nothing can be pinned down. Nothing can be held down. It's not a difficult concept really, but to understand it fully, to really feel the truth of it so that we don't get hooked around any event, any moment doesn't hook us. To contemplate uh, impermanence, and no self. Really, you can just contemplate those two things, impermanence and no self, and all the rest of the teachings kind of flow into, flow into those. You could actually just contemplate impermanence or just interdependence, and you would come to no self. 
Each one is a gate into the other. You can take any one of the teachings and look closely enough and it reveals all the other teachings. So the teachings are not actually complicated. It doesn't require a great intellect. It doesn't require great reading or great understanding in that sense, like intellectual understanding. But those things can be very helpful. But it mostly is in our zazen and in our daily contemplation, just looking deeply, being very curious and really aspiring to want to understand deeply. Want to understand so that we know it for ourselves. We're not repeating someone else's words. We're not parroting someone else's words. When we say the words, they're our words because we know them. That kind of knowing, that's, that's, that's what the Buddha's calling us to do. That's what the Buddha did. He went by himself at a certain point and sat beneath the Bodhi tree himself until he understood for himself. Another uh, quote that was in this chapter is, all beings contain within themselves the seeds of enlightenment. Well, this is what the Buddha exclaimed at his awakening as he awoke to the morning star. All beings contain within themselves the seeds of enlightenment, and yet we drown in the ocean of birth and death for so many thousands of lifetimes. So all beings contain within themselves the seeds of enlightenment. This is very encouraging. It's saying all of us can, can not just wake up a bit, we can fully wake up. All of us can fully wake up. We can be, we all can be enlightened by reality. It's possible for all of us. And we actually do it at moments in time. I think we often are actually functioning from an enlightened state. It's just it's brief. We just briefly do it when somebody trips and we just put our hand out to help them so they don't fall. In that moment, we're enlightened. In that moment, we're functioning out of the unity of all things without forethought. It's just for most of us, it's not sustained. That state isn't sustained, but it can be sustained for every moment of our life. And it says here, and yet we drown in the ocean of birth and death for so many thousands of lifetimes. We can hear this birth and death, not just as literally being born, dying, being reborn and dying, being reborn and dying in, in, in that sense, but birth and death in the cycle of things are going well. Oh no, now things aren't going so well. Oh good, now they're going well again. Oh God. Why did that have to happen? Now they're going badly again, <laughs> up and down. It's like that kind of birth and death. Uh, I exist and I'm worried what people think of me. Oh, phew, now I'm not so worried what people think of me. Oh my God, now I'm worried what people think of me. Huh, I'm not so worried what people think of me. Those kinds of births and deaths. We can be liberated from this constant uh, so imprisonment, because he uses the word jailer, imprisonment of the conditioned world. We can be freed from the birth and death of the depend, being dependent on the conditioned world for our state of mind. Because the conditioned world is in a state of continual flux and good things go away and bad things arise, arrive and there's no getting away from that. And great things arrive too and bad things go away but it's going to continually be like that. There's no getting away from, from that uh, flow. Bills get paid, new bills arrive. <laughs> it doesn't go away. Your phone is charged and then it's nearly flat again. You've got to charge it again. Now it's nearly flat again. <laughs> you lose your charger, you find your charger. <laughs> it never stops. So that's like the cycle of birth and death that we can be liberated from birth and death, we can think of it that way. And right at the end of this chapter, it's so lovely the way the Buddha engages with this boy and his buffalo and the kusa grass. He just comes back to something so incredibly simple about caring for this child and whether his buffalo will have grass to eat. 
I think this is a beautiful instruction for us that, uh, that the enlightenment that we're speaking of isn't anything other than actually caring about ordinary life, caring about whatever's in front of us. And that's what the Buddha did after this great awakening under the Bodhi tree. He wants to check that the buffalo will have some grass and that the grass will have to get time to hang out with the buffalo and get digested in the buffalo's tummy. Multiple stomachs, I think, buffaloes maybe have. So today we're going to do things a little differently because uh, I felt like at the Zendo we were very connected to each other without speaking, just being in that Zendo space together, gardening together, having orioki together, there was a strong sense, I imagine, I felt it for myself, of really feeling part of something bigger than myself with all of you. But now we're on Zoom for the next two days, so I thought it would be probably more beneficial to introduce talking again. So what we can do now, I shall turn the record off. Let's go, where's record? Pause recording. Stop recording. Stop recording.